Right, thank you very much for um, inviting me to come and talk to your uh, Radical Statistics Conference on such a great topic, is, is Britain pulling to part? And I think um, there's so many different ways that it is pulling apart uh, at the moment, and particularly over the last, last four years. Um, and I want to talk, as um, Pierre said, particularly about the way that it's pulling apart um, the, the fabric of gender equality that was very carefully and imperfectly built up um, over the, uh, the years of the Labour government. I say imperfectly, but actually I think a lot of progress was, was made in the 90s um, towards, towards and early uh, and 2000s towards gender equality. But since 2010, since the first emergency budget in, in June 2010, there's been growing evidence and growing awareness um, in, the, in the UK that economic, the economic policy, the, the approach taken by the coalition to reducing um, public deficit is actually having quite a strong detrimental impact on, on women. And I should emphasize, of course, this is not to say that it's not having an impact on men, it's not to say that it's, not having, that it's having an impact on all women, but I think what I'd like to present today is quite strong evidence that there, the way in which um, the approach to gender, um, to economic deficit reduction is being approached is particularly having, uh, having a bad effect on, on women. And this is particularly apt for International Women's Day, but as Pierre said as well, not just International Women's Day. I think there's been quite a, a lot of coverage over this, about this building up over the last um, four years or so, but I saw you know, the headline article in the Independent today and the I um, paper as well um, p was, was exactly on this issue, highlighting the fact that of the, um, that women are paying about three quarters of the cost of deficit reduction. And the figure that they had was since 2010, and this is figures coming from the Labour Party, um, 11.6 billion pounds has been raised from women and three billion pounds has been raised from men through changes in tax and, and benefits. And this is because the government's approach to um, to tackling deficit is by is through cuts rather than raising taxation. I think that's at the heart of um, of what's what's going wrong. So what that's what I want to um, to uh, to cover today. Um, the government, of course, would claim that they were doing something quite quite different. Um, when we listen to the George Os Osborne's budget speeches and um, statements he gives around. Um, his autumn statement, you know, you hear these lovely phrases that we're all in this together. It's fair that all sections who are able to do so um, to contribute, do contribute to deficit reduction. Those with the broadest shoulders should, should bear, bear the latest, um, bear the greatest load. So there's this very strong re rhetoric about, about fairness and about, um, about equality um, in the process of, of deficit reduction. Um, but there's actually no awareness underpinning this that, you know, that fairness also requires an analysis of who is actually able to contribute to deficit reduction and a recognition that not everybody is able to share equally and to identify those who aren't able to share. Um, and also, they, because they don't do proper impact analysis of their uh, economic policy, they don't actually recognise, and they're a complete denial about the fact that actually those who can afford it least are actually paying more. And we can see that whether we look at you know, um, different households, if we look at um, you know, different um, deciles of income distribution, the burden is falling on the, the poorest households rather than the highest households. And then the same goes um, for, for gender as well. Now, I, I'm involved with the, the Women's Budget Group, and that's a fantastic way for me to kind of channel my anger about what's going um, what's going on. But I'm also in the in the position that I'm, uh, I'm a, I live in Tatton constituency. So last at the end of last year, I wrote to my my MP as concerned from Tatton, and I said, I'm you know I'm very concerned about the impact of your policies on. Um, on women and on gender equality um, more generally. And I sent him a nice little briefing that the Women's um, Budget Group ha had produced um, uh, round about the budget la last year. And I got a nice long email reply from, from him um, and in which he detailed the, the, the number of ways in which um, the government is very concerned about gender equality and the kind of measures that it's taking and the kind of progress that it's making to, um, uh, to help women. And the kind of things that he outlined, or his aide, or whoever wrote this email, outlined to me was um, job growth in the private sector, that, that actually there were record numbers of, of jobs now. 
um, the unemployment was falling, um, and that it was falling at, a, at the fastest rate since the recession. And that um, the jobs that were being created, a large number of them were full, or the majority of them were full-time permanent jobs. So this is great. Um, he also emphasised the measures that the government was taking to put money back in people's pockets, um, emphasising particularly the tax allowance, the raising of the, the tax allowance, and also um, the transferable tax allowance, um, you know, the married couples tax allowance that they were introducing um, as well. So again, you know, concrete measures, and he was trying to assure me that these were, um, these were good for, for, for women as well as um, for men. But actually, you know, it was kind of evidence that he hadn't read the briefing that I'd sent him because the kind of work that the Women's Budget Group to, um, is to say, well, actually, when we look at these measures and we look at the impact of these measures on men and women, are they feeling the benefit um, equally? And the evidence that I'm going to show you today is that, um, you know, that job growth isn't um, benefiting men and women um, equally, um, particularly in, in the private sector. And a lot of the measures that the chances come up with to you know, try and put money back in our pockets is, is benefiting um, men uh, more than, than, than women. Um, so there's, you know, at the, at the bottom of what the government is doing is a fundamental misunderstanding of what gender impact assessing is about and why it's, um, why it's so in, um, important. And indeed, today, in response to um, the new figures that have come out from the Labour Party, um, the government response, as quoted in The Independent, was, well, you know, there's an economic recovery. This has got to be good for everybody. Um, and also, you know, let's not focus on who gets the money in families, where the money goes to, because everybody shares money within families. And they have no evidence whether or not this is, um, this is the case. So for a number of reasons, I'm very concerned about this, um, uh, this little troika um, here who are not so radical uh, as the, the, the troika um, in, in this room. So, so my argument today is, is basically um, uh, threefold. Firstly, that women are paying a higher price for austerity in terms of income, employment, and uh, as a result of the cuts in public um, uh, services. Now, why is this the case? It's partly to do with the approach that the government's taking in the first place. About 80% of um, deficit reduction is being done through cuts, and just about 20% through um, raises, um, increases in, in taxation. So it's a cuts agenda. We know that. But it's 80% a cuts agenda now, according to the um, Institute for Fiscal um, Studies. And this affects women um, particularly because um, women's um, a greater share of women's income comes from social security transfers than does a man's. About one-fifth of a woman's income comes from social security transfers and tax credits compared to about one-tenth of, man, of a man's. And this is because women are more likely to be poor at different points of, of the life cycle. Um, they're more likely to be carers um, and so claim um, social security transfers for the people that they care for as well as for themselves. And they're also more likely to, to live longer than men. So they're actually going to be um, uh, on, the, on their own, possibly, um, in, in retirement and needing um, financial support then. And particularly, their uh, pensions are smaller, so they're going to need to rely on income transfers more then. Um, so the cuts, you know, the cuts in benefit, the scrapping of benefits, benefit freezes, benefit um, uh, caps, all of those measures that we've seen over the last four years are, are chipping away at quite a, um, a radical and... Um, and um, uh, and sort of determined way at, at incomes. Um, they're more affected by employment because, as we know, about 66% of public sector employers were um, or are women. And we also know that men and women make different use of public services. And again, women make more use of public services and therefore more affected by the cuts. And again, because they're poorer, they're less able to afford to go to the market. They use public services for the people that they care for and for themselves. And because they live longer, they're going to need public services for, for a longer period of, um, of time. My second point is going to be that women aren't benefiting on equal terms to men from the tax giveaways that, um, that the that government is, has introduced to try and put money back in people's pockets. And also, women aren't benefiting on equal terms to men from the nascent economic recovery, as, um, uh, as the, ch the Chancellor would like us to, um, to see. So in so many ways, the, the, what the coalition is doing is 
putting into reverse this progress towards gender equality, and actually, you know, it is another way that, that Britain is, is pulling apart. So what I'm going to end with at the end is um, some examples of, of what maybe needs to be done in order to, uh, to bring, this, bring this back together. The work that I'm going to be drawing on is from the Women's Budget Group. Now, for those of you who don't know who the Women's Budget Group are, we're a, um, a collection of academics, trade unionists, um, uh, people from NGOs, some people from charities who have been around since um, the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s. And, and what we do is that every, every budget, every spending review, every autumn financial statement, we provide a, a gendered response to, um, to the measures, and we try to um, put together a case for what a more gender equal version of economic policy um, would be. And since 2010, we've been monitoring you know, all of the coalition's announcements, um, which are all up on our website. I, um, I don't know if the, the slides are going to be circulated, but if, if, they, if they are, when you click on, on this link, it will take you to the Women's Budget Group website and to an example of one of our, um, our um, our longer um, assessments. Um, and we've also been working very closely since 2010 with Howard Reed from Landman Economics um, to uh, use his modelling on the impact of changes in tax and benefits and spending on public services. Um, he models it very carefully on different, uh, the impact on different households and he's been able to do some gendered analysis for us. So what I'm presenting today is the work that um, we've been doing, uh, um, doing with him. And the, the Women's Budget Group's work, you know, isn't standalone. We're not the only people that, that are saying this. As I said before, there was this big announcement this morning of the new work from the Labour Party, and that is part of an ongoing project that was triggered by um, Yvette Cooper, when she was a qualities minister, where she was commissioning work from the House of Commons Library to do a gendered analysis of everything that the, that the government was changing in terms of tax and benefit. And the Institute, of, uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies has also paired up with the Fawcett Society to, um, to do an, um, a kind of a cumulative analysis of all the measures and how they affect uh, men and women. And the picture is pretty much um, consistent. So I want to talk through some of these findings and, um, and then at the end come to... Uh, present a little bit of a more positive picture of what I think um, uh, could be done. So as I said, Howard, um, with Howard Reed, the Women's Budget Group's been um, kind of plotting the impact of cuts in public services and the impact of changes in tax and benefits on different types um, of household. It can't be done on an individual basis, but we can do it at different kinds of households. And we can break down the households into different sort of gendered categories of households, and we get quite clear pictures of what the impact there um, is. This first graph is um, a kind of from our um, budget statement, um, our budget announcement last uh, June, and um, what what it is is a, um, a, an assessment of the cumulative impact of cuts in public services, all public services, on different kinds of households. And you can see already there's a quite clear findings that uh, that lone parents have lost about eight percent, or have had a um, an eight percent reduction in their um, their income as a consequence of these cuts. And I think single pensioners and couples with children are also quite um, harshly affected um, by these cuts. And you can see this is a breakdown of the different kind of, um, kind of services that, um, that, these different, uh, that people in these different households use. And so you can see for lone parents, one of the, the biggest cuts, one of the biggest um, causes of um, a reduction of, of their Net income is because of the cuts in early years services, sure start and, and things like that. Um, with single pensioners, you can see it's cuts to social care. <coughs> so we can see where the cuts have been made, and then we can map that onto the different um, uh, house type of households that use those services. Um, moving on, this combines the impact of cuts on, um, on services with the impact of changes in tax and benefits. And when you combine those, you can see that the, um, uh, the impact is, is similar, um, but also compounded. So you can see that, again, lone parents have 
um, lost um, almost 15%. Uh, have had a reduction of their standard of living of about 11 um, of their income about 11 percent as a consequence of these measures and single pensioners are um, very much affected as well and it's a bit counterintuitive because we think that actually pensioners are one of the groups that have been um, protected from cuts in in benefits and they've maintained a lot of their universal benefits such as the um, you know the winter tax uh, the winter fuel allowance and things like that but they have been uh, quite significantly affected by increases in tax such as VAT What we've also done is break down the um, analysis by different kinds of households of a particular group. So here we have families with children. We've got couples with children on the left, male lone parents and female lone parents. So we can see that even within a group of parents, households with, um, with children, it's female lone parents who are more harshly affected by these measures than lone parents and of course um, male lone parents and of course <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there are many more female lone parents than there are male lone parents. About 98% of lone parent households are female lone parent households. <coughs> A similar pattern um, is there when we look at pensioner households as well. Female single pensioners are much more harshly affected by um, the cuts in thank you, Charlie, by these cuts in services and changes in, in benefits um, and, and taxation uh, than our male single pensioners or couple um, pensioners. So I think this is um, really important findings, and not least as a way of um, you know when when the government comes out with. Um, statements like it did today saying well you know it doesn't really matter where benefits are paid to because money is redistributed within families well when you're on your own it isn't and actually the families that are most hardest hit, or the households that are most harshly hit are single person households whether they're single parent single pensioner or even if we move um, on further this is um, <coughs> um This is families without children. And even amongst families without children, <coughs> we can see that it's single women who are more harshly affected than couples without children or single men. So you can see there's a pattern um, emerging and a pattern... <coughs> the pattern is quite consistently that men are, um, are not faring as, as badly in the cuts agenda than are women. And I reiterate, this is because women rely more on benefits and more on um, public services than do men. Okay, another kind of a micro part of this analysis is to look at some of the um, changes in, um, in taxation that have happened since um, the election in 19. Uh, uh, in 2010, one of the first things that the government did was raise the um, rate of indirect taxation from 17.5% to 20%. That was in the June budget with effect from the 4th of January 2011. Now, this was um, a way of raising quite a significant amount of money. About £12 uh, million pounds was, was raised in that, um, in that first fiscal year. So what the Women's Budget Group did um, with... Uh, was, was to have a look at what the, who was actually paying this and who was, um, who was not paying. So what, if you look at the, the chart on the right, this shows the incidence of VAT in different kinds of households. And you can see from that that um, working, so working age children, um, working age households with children, it's again single women with children, single lone parents, who are most harshly affected by the increase in VAT. It's really eating into their incomes. And this is despite the fact that a lot of items that you think, you know, lone parents might buy for their children are actually zero rated um, in, in VAT. We, we um, modelled that in as well. Um, and also, lone, um, pension couple, um, lone mothers, pension couples, and couples with children are all the households that are paying the most as a proportion of their household incomes because of this increase in VAT. Um, 
who does it affect the least? It affects single childless men um, the least. So this is another case of, you know, when we think back to that picture of that, that troika saying we're all in this together and those with the broadest shoulders pay the most, you know, this is all evidence to say that's actually not the case. I don't think I was class lone single mothers as um, those with the biggest capacity to, to solve the, um, the deficit reduction. What I want to do now is to go through um, three more examples of tax giveaways. So uh, this is an example of a tax increase. Well, actually, you know, even though the Chancellor is saying there is no money, there is nothing that we can do, you know, we have to make these cuts, well, actually, he's found money for some tax giveaways. And um, uh, not necessarily the things that we might want to prioritise, but there you go. Um, what we did in the Women's Budget Group was to actually look at who was benefiting from these tax giveaways. So it's taking money away from, um, from low-income women, it's taken money away from child benefit, from child tax credits, things like that, or well, who is it giving money back to? The first example is um, this increase in the um, personal tax allowance. So raising the level at which you have to start paying taxation. <coughs> The aim of which, again, is to introduce a more fa a fairer taxation system. Uh, it was raised initially to um, just over 8,000 in 2012, 2013, and we know that, you know, driven by the Lib Dems, this is actually um, a program to get tax, the tax threshold raged, um, raised to about 10,000 at some point. So um, this is going to do quite a lot to lift people out of taxation grant them that, 56% of the people who were initially lifted out, out, out of um, taxation as a result of this measure were women. But actually, when you look at it in cash terms, so how much, is, um, how much will be um, saved by men and how much will sa be saved by, by women, well, actually, men are saving a lot more than um, women are. So 680 um, million um, will go to men who pay tax and 500 and um, 14 million will go to women who pay tax. Now, the next point of this argument, which the Women's Budget Group has been trying to get out there as much as possible, is that this does absolutely nothing. This kind of measure, this kind of policy does absolutely nothing to help the people who earn so little that they don't pay tax in the first place. So anybody now earning un, you know, um, un, under uh, 10,000, if it goes up to 10,000, it will do nothing for them. And these are the people that have lost the most because of the cuts in benefits that um, have been introduced since 2010. And, um, and we looked at this from the Labour Force survey of, of 2009, 2010. We worked out that um, 3.6, um, sorry, 3.7 million um, people earned too little at that time to be paying um, tax. And so this measure wouldn't have helped them at all. And 73% of those were women. You know, these are women who might be working part time, who were on the minimum wage who um, are maybe you know, self-employed and not earning enough to pay, pay tax. So there's a, a massive raft of people at the bottom in those you know, um, lowest income deciles who really are benefiting nothing from these kind of tax giveaways. These are for um, more um, people further up the income um, scale. The second example is fuel duty. Now, fuel duty, um, uh, round about, you know, a couple of budgets ago was this big issue. Um, the, the truckers were out, um, up in arms because of this planned increase um, in fuel duty because of the fuel duty escalator. This was something that Labour introduced to make sure that, that fuel costs rose with inflation, I think it was. And, um, uh, and this was due to raise income um, uh, uh, tax on fuel uh, a little bit in the March 2011 budget. So the Chancellor decided to abolish the fuel duty escalator and to cut fuel duty by a penny in, in the pound. So this is a major tax giveaway um, uh, worth about 1.9 uh, billion in 2011-2012, and so we looked at who benefits from this. And you can see, again, from this inc incidence um, graph, that the, um, the people who benefit the least are single female pensioners and lone mothers. And the people that benefit the most are um, 
couple households without children and single males. So, you know, you get this picture building up of a, of a redistribution from um, single pensioners and lone, um, and lone parents to um, other groups who maybe don't need um, that additional income as much as single families um, with children. My third example is a much more recent one, uh, the transferable tax allowance. Um, I think came in because of pressure from, from the back benches, um, but it was packaged very much as a way of putting money back into families' pockets. So it's a, a way of transferring a thousand pounds of your tax allowance between couples who are married or in civil partnerships if neither of them pays above the basic rate of tax. So this is, again, you know, for lower um, income um, uh, families. So the higher earner would pay up to less, um, up to 200 pounds less um, tax per year. It's maybe not a huge amount, but um, it's costing the Treasury about 700 um, million um, a year. So we had a look to see who benefits from, uh, from this measure. And um, well, the first thing to say is lots of couples won't benefit. If you're not married, forget it. You're not going to get anything. If you're a lone parent, forget it. You know, you're not, this is not a, the kind of um, uh, thing that's going to benefit you at all. Um, but actually, when we looked a bit deeper, we worked out that fewer than a third of married couples are actually going to gain from this measure. So it's a married couple's tax allowance. So because it's only for those on lower incomes, only about a third of married couples will gain. And only 18% of families with children are going to gain. So this is not something that's going to support families with children. It's probably going to um, benefit quite a lot of um, older um, pensioner um, couples. Um, and the pay because the payment's going to go to the higher earner, um, this is going to be, in 85% of cases, it's going to be money going to the man in the couple rather than to, to the woman. Now, again, the Conservatives or the Coalition would say, it doesn't matter who we pay it to. It just goes into the family pot, and then it's up to families to spend that. Well, you know, that's fine, but actually there is, you know, feminist economic research that says... Um, uh, that, that money is not always redistributed with, um, evenly within fa um, families and that money can be used as, as a way of um, uh, exerting power over other, other people. So I think this is very, very problematic. Um, again, you know, couples who are too poor to use the full tax allowance will, will always also gain nothing. And you can see from this Institute for Fiscal Studies chart that the main beneficiaries are in the middle um, income in the third to the sixth income decile and not um, really at, at the bottom. So, you know, three evidences of money being put back into people's pockets which are benefiting some people but actually not benefiting the people that have lost out most as um, a consequence of austerity. And those people who have lost out most, as I've shown so far, have um, tended to be um, women rather than men. Right, For, last thing that I want to just get off my chest, I like to um, have a go at the, uh, the coalition every, every now and then, I need it, <laughs> keeps, me, um, keeps me sane. Um, the last thing that I want to, <coughs> to look at is uh, this claim that, the, uh, that George Osborne made to me in, my, in his email to me, but is also made more broadly about, well, you know, we're in economic recovery now, and this has to be good. We're all, you know, we're all going to benefit from the, the green shoots um, of re recovery. And when I get round to replying to his email, which, which I haven't done yet, uh, these are the kind of things that I um, will, will point out to him. Um, yes, unemployment's falling, but men's unemployment um, is, uh, has fallen um, more significantly than women's. And actually, um, since the peak of the crisis, women's unemployment has increased overall, whereas men's has, has gone down. So, you know, unemployment might be falling, but it's not falling for everybody. Um, the second point that I'd make to him is that, well, yes, you know, there are some new jobs, and, yeah, there might be record numbers of women um, in, in employment now. But actually, this claim of his that any job losses in the public sector are going to be um, replaced by jobs in the private sector isn't something that's, that's benefiting um, women in terms of the actual jobs, but it's also not doing much good to women in terms of the conditions of employment that they're going into when they take jobs in the private sector. 
So first of all, in terms of the numbers of jobs, the Women's Budget Group worked out that for every 100 new net jobs created, 63 of these went to men and only 63% um, of these went to, um, went to men and 37% went to women. Now, why is this? Our hunch is that this is because a lot of the investment, a lot of the focus on um, economic recovery is on um, investment in physical infrastructure, on roads and construction, on broadband, flood defences, um, rail, HS2, you know, all those kind of things. And so the jobs are not jobs where women are traditionally very strongly represented. So uh, we think that this is one of the reasons why women aren't benefiting from these new jobs that, um, that are being created. Um, what we also are very concerned about is that as women move into jobs in the private um, sector, the evidence is that the new jobs that are be being created, a lot of them are temporary, a lot of them are part-time, um, and a lot of them are in conditions that are much worse than the conditions that women have been used to in the public sector. Um, and there's an awful lot of involuntary part-time employment um, amongst women. It's higher than that, um, the rate amongst men. So women are going, if when they're getting jobs in the private sector, the jobs aren't as good, the conditions aren't as good, and they're not getting the hours that they need to actually sustain their, themselves and their, their families. The most, I think one of the, the next graph shows this quite clearly, the gen, about the gender pay gap. And this is a massive concern anyway, but actually a lot of progress was made to close the gender pay gap in the public sector. And you can see, that's the blue line, you can see that over the years, the gender pay gap, the gap between what men and women are, um, earn in the public sector went down quite significantly. But then, you know, a couple of years ago started to go, um, go up again. In the public, in the private sector, the rate of um, change, has, um, it's always been higher, and the rate of, um, of, of in a decrease in the gender pay gap has been much shallower, and it started going up again. So this is another significant issue for, for concern, that if women are to be taking jobs in the private sector, they're not going to be earning um, as much as their, their male um, counterparts. So that's the kind of hmm, a bit of a bleak picture for International Women's Day, isn't it? So um, I, need, I need to get that off my chest. I need to um, uh, share with you what the Women's Budget Group and other organisations have been finding about how progress towards gender equality has been moving backwards um, and how this is affecting some groups of women quite significantly. I mean, single pensioners and single loan parents... Um, or female lone parents are the, are the two um, groups of, of women that keep coming up. And, um, and those are the two groups that are particularly prone to, to poverty, um, although their rates of poverty decreased quite significantly during the, the labour years. But we're, we're going backwards um, now. Yeah, but because it's Women's Budget Day, I don't want to <coughs> end on a, on a completely um, downbeat note. And what I want to look at, finish by looking at, is just three slides that try and outline how we think this could be done differently. Um, the budget's coming up later this month. This is George Osborne's last budget where he can actually show that he's aware of this issue, he's aware of this impact, and he could do something about it. We're not, uh, let's not hold our breath. Um, we might have to wait for, for a change of, of government to actually see um, any progress. Um, but in the meantime, let's start talking about what the alternative should be. Um, so the, f um, the Women's Budget Group has been coming up with um, you know, Osborne always says there's no plan B. So we said, well, you know, what about a plan F? And plan F is a, is a feminist alternative um, economic recovery strategy that includes women, um, allows them to be financially autonomous. This, we think, is really important. Uh, yeah, families do share, but actually it's really important for women to have um, an autonomous source of income. Um, and also we need an economic recovery that supports their inclusion in, in paid employment on equal terms to men, with equal salaries to men, and, and also emphasises and values care work as much as it does paid work for men and for women. Um, first of all, in, in terms of adequate incomes, we need immediate action. I think we need immediate action now to start reversing some of the drastic cuts that we've seen to the incomes of people right in the lowest um, income deciles um, and particularly, um, we would say, for the in to reverse the incomes um, of, of women. Um, we need to reverse some of the cuts, the freezes, the caps on social security um, and tax credits. And as a kind of a concrete illustration of what you could do, we said, you know, the transferable tax allowance, that 
700 million could actually be used to compensate for two of the four years that child benefit was, was frozen, or actually we could use that to reinstate universal child benefit, and that would um, be one step to achieving some of the aims that we have of, um, of giving women um, a, a, an autonomous um, income. But on the longer term, what we need is a, is a living wage, so a wage that actually allows people to, to live without the need to claim tax credits or top up um, benefits. They, what they earn is enough to feed their families and, and pay their rent and their, um, their housing costs. Um, we need to close the gender pay gap, particularly in the private sector and particularly amongst part-time workers. What I didn't mention is that the gender pay gap amongst um, women who work part-time <coughs> and men who work um, full-time is, I think, is about 40%. Um, percent. <coughs> How are we going to get there? Well, the first thing that we've um, focused on is the need for, instead of just focusing on physical infrastructure, the roads, the broadband, the flood defences, construction, new houses, well, actually, what we need is social infrastructure. We need to start thinking about um, caring services for children and for elderly um, relatives as well, as not a cost that should be avoided, but actually as an investment in the future social capital of this, of this country and also an investment in the capacity for men and women to work um, in paid work on an equal basis. Um, seeing f um, social infrastructure as a kind of investment would give men and women equal access to, um, to employment and create quality jobs for, um, for women as well. It'd give universal childcare and um, universal support for um, uh, social care for, for the elderly. And then finally, um, of course, you know, part of the reason that we got into, um, into this mess was because of the, the very um, divided occupational, um, uh, um, gendered occupational structure in this, in this country. So actually what we want to do on a long-term basis is make sure that women and girls are benefiting equally from employment opportunities in physical infrastructure as well. We all know that, that girls and, and young women don't take STEM subjects. Well, actually we need to take concerted um, action to make sure that, that women are going into those professions, are going into um, taking up the apprenticeships that get them involved in, um, in, in, in occupations to do with physical infrastructure um, and, um, and so that they can benefit from the, um, the, the more lucrative wages that come from those sectors as well. So we need to train more women in those, um, in those occupations and those um, uh, professions. We need to make those jobs more family friendly and part of that is about you know, overcoming gender, gender stereotyping from a very young age. Um, right up to um, university to make sure that girls and boys, young men, young women have open options when they choose their subjects and their future um, and their future careers. So that was, um, you know, in sum, um, I, w I would say Britain is pulling apart when it comes to gender equality. We can see that um, progress towards gender equality has stalled and has gone um, backwards, and I think that quite radical um, action is required to, to recognise, to understand um, exactly what this looks like through this, you know, the, the kind of the detailed um, analysis that I showed you, and to think about ways that we can address this now, to, um, to make life easier now for uh, women of different ages and um, different life circumstances, and to try and change the trajectory for men and women in the longer term.